Welcome to our Let's Play of Zork 1 on the TRS-80 Color Computer. Why the Coco? I mean, I just did a playthrough on the Model 1 that you saw just last week, didn't I? Well, to be honest, I would like to say I felt the Model 1 playthrough was a bit rough, and doing it again on the Coco would allow me to clean it up, but that would be a lie. The truth is, I always intended to do this. You see, I may have originally played Zork 1 back on the Model 1 when it was first released by Personal Software, and I had to play it there again, for posterity's sake. But a part of my heart will always belong to the TRS-80 Coco 2, and in honor of that fact, we do this here now. There's a lot of information about Zork, and not a lot of space to do it in here. And I give some of that information in my previous Let's Play, and you should at least go and watch the introduction if you have not. I will not be repeating it here. However, I should say, if you have only the time to watch one of my playthroughs, watch this one. It will be more clean, and it will give more game information. But first, I want to talk a little bit about ZIL, or the Zork Implementation Language. I am far from being an expert in it. In fact, I have barely begun to even touch it as anything more than a user. But I do know it was a genius move made by the programmers. See, before Infocom was even formed, the game Zork, or Dungeon, was written in Model, spelled out M-D-L, which is a dialect of Lisp. This worked perfectly well on mainframes, but it was absolutely no way that home microcomputers could run it. They just did not have the memory capacity. The solution? Why not write a computer language that had only the bare minimum required to run the computer and the program itself? Which they did by creating what they called a Z machine, a virtual machine which they could port over to whatever system they were wanting to run their game on. A Z machine for TristDOS, a Z machine for Commodore DOS, a Z machine for Apple DOS. You get the idea. By doing this, they could then write their games in what was called Z code files, the actual story files, which would be universal, but would load into each of the various Z machines, allowing them to only have to write each game in one format instead of across many different platforms. There's a lot of other minutiae that is not important to know at this time. Obviously, the Z and Z machine stands for Zork, their flagship project. There are multiple generations of Z code, sometimes being DAT files. There are many permutations of Zork itself, and the one we will be using is Revision 88, from 26 July 1984. This one is the most well-known, and is considered the most polished, best version of the game. And as I said before, we will be playing this on a TRS-80 color computer, which has 64K and a floppy drive. If you're watching this now, and you have watched the playthrough that I did on the TRS-80 Model 1, you will have noticed that when I loaded it, I loaded it by putting the disk in the disk drive and hitting the reset. By doing that, it booted up in its own operating system. You'll see it works a little bit differently on the Coco. For example, if I hit reset, it just comes up as a normal boot up sequence. Instead, there are multiple ways I can approach this. The first way is to have a look at the directory, which you will see game.bin, and I can go load m for machine language game as I would normally any other binary game and then type execute, and it will load the story is loading, and as you see here, Zork 1, the Great Underground Empire. But instead, another way that I could do it, hitting reset, is I can just do a directory to make sure that the disk is still there so you can see what I'm doing. And instead of going load M, I'm going to just say DOS, Disk Operating System, and the game itself will start up that way. So there are multiple ways to approach this on the Coco that are not on the Model 1. West of House, that is our location. Zork 1, the Great Underground Empire, copyright 1981, 1982, 1983. Infocom Incorporated, all rights reserved. Zork is a registered trademark of Infocom Inc. Revision 88, just like I said before. 
serial number 840726. That is the year 1984, the seventh month, the 26th day. We are west of the house, standing in an open field west of a white house with a boarded front door. There is a small mailbox here. Now, if you recall from our previous playthrough, I went and I opened the mailbox and then I got the leaflet and then I read the leaflet and then I put the leaflet back in the mailbox and then I closed the mailbox. And I want to show you that this parser has more to it than just the ability to do one thing at a time. So what we're going to do is we're going to open the mailbox and get leaflet and read leaflet and put there's not enough room here to put the leaflet back in the mailbox as it only allows me so many characters at a time. So let's see what happens when I tell it open mailbox and get leaflet and read leaflet. Takes a moment as it processes and then it is going to tell us opening the small mailbox reveals a leaflet. Taken. Welcome to Zork. Zork is a game of adventure, danger, and low cunning. In it, you will explore some of the most amazing territory ever seen by mortals. No computer should be without one. And depending on what system you're running it on, it says whether or not it should be no computer, no TRS-80, no Commodore, no PDP-10. They all had their own variations of this, and depending on the game revision, there are multiple versions of this opening message. Let's put leaflet in mailbox and close mailbox. There is no reason for me to put the leaflet back in the mailbox and close it. I could just drop it, but I don't feel like littering. So I'm not going to do that. Now I can go south, which will move us south of the house. When you're facing the south side of a white house. There is no door here and all the windows are boarded. We're going to go east. You're behind the White House. A path leads into the forest to the east. In one corner of the house, there is a small window, which is slightly ajar. Open the window. With great effort, you open the window far enough to allow entry. So we want to go in the house. In some versions, you can say enter house. Others, you can say enter window. Some, you can say enter house or enter window. There are some versions where I can say enter window and you will hit your head and not go in. So we're going to go with enter house. We are in the kitchen. We're in the kitchen of the White House. A table seems to have been recently used for the preparation of food. A passage leads to the west and a dark staircase can be seen leading upward. A dark chimney leads down and to the east is a small window which is open where we came from. On the table is an elongated brown sack smelling of hot peppers. A bottle is sitting on the table. The glass bottle contains a quantity of water. Some notes about here. The bag. It is an important item and if you cut the bag or do anything to destroy the bag you will destroy what is inside of it and what is inside of it, some garlic, we need for completing the game with the full score. And the game alludes to there being somebody else around that you will never meet who actually closes a door behind you and bars it shut. And it's often theorized that the person or creature who is doing this is the one who was making the sandwich. Now the sandwich fixings and the glass bottle with water in it is one of the solutions to a later puzzle dealing with a cyclops, though you'll see when we get there, I prefer a different solution to the puzzle. So we're not going to do anything with anything here at this current time. Instead, we're going to go west again. And in when we go west, we're going to see a living room. We're in the living room. There's a doorway to the east, where we came from, a wooden door with strange gothic lettering to the west, which appears to be nailed shut, a trophy case, and a large oriental rug in the center of the room. Above the trophy case hangs an elvish sword of great antiquity. A battery-powered brass lantern is on the trophy case. It is important in almost every game that we have played to take whatever lanterns you run into. 
this is no different. This is one of the early games. The Lantern is very important and it has a limited number of uses before it runs out and game over. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by reading the lettering. This is a Easter egg. The engravings translate to this space intentionally left blank which is, I believe, a reference to not only how manuals had that written back in the, the day that this was made to say this space or this page intentionally left blank. It's also a reference to one of the creators, Marc Blanc, whose name is spelled the same as blank. Another thing that is an interesting Easter egg that we're going to explore here is this sword, this elvish sword of great antiquity. It's a great sword, and when we run into certain things in the game, it starts to glow. It glows because it's warning us of danger. Now, this led me to talking to one of my followers here on this channel, this YouTube channel, who I was explaining to her that it felt to me like a reference to some of Tolkien's works, that the swords that were carried, made by the demi-humans, would often glow when danger was nearby. And she suggested that I try different names. And so, obviously, one of the first names I tried was Orchrist. Orchrist being also known as Biter, which was Thorin Oakenshield's sword. When I say get Orchrist, it is taken. So I could say get sword, I could say get Orchrist, or I could even say get Glamdring, who's also known as Foe Hammer or Beater. And it does not respond to Biter, Foe Hammer, or Beater, but Gandalf's sword being named those things, Glamdring, also works. It unfortunately does not respond to Sting, which was the nickname given to the sword that Bilbo carried, which makes me believe they were a fan or fans of the Lord of the Rings, but not so much of the Hobbit. So let's get the lamp, because the first thing we're going to do is go and get a rope and a very nasty knife that's very important. So let's head back east into the kitchen and remember, here there is a chimney, and there is a stairway that goes up. Now, the chimney goes down. We cannot go down the chimney. You can come up the chimney, as we'll find out later, but you can go up the stairs. So let's go up, and it will be dark. We have moved into a dark place. It is pitch black. You are likely to be eaten by a crew. And I've gone through great efforts to not use you are likely to be eaten by a crew in anything other than in the game itself. I, I know it is iconic. It's everything that you run into out there that is Zork. They blazon you are likely to be eaten by a crew right on the front so you know it is Zork. And I feel that it's overdone. So I'm not going to do it. Instead, I am going to light my lamp. And the reason I waited until I was in the pitch dark in order to light the lamp is because it saves one turn, one charge of the lamp. The brass lantern is now on. We're in an attic. This is the attic. The only exit is a stairway leading down. A large coil of rope is lying in the corner. On the table is a nasty looking knife. So let's get the rope and the knife. taken and taken. And then we're going to go down, and once we're down, we are going to extinguish the lamp. The brass lantern is now off. Now here, I'm going to drop the knife on the table. And I do this because I want to keep track of where the knife is, and I always felt that the knife belongs on the table next to where a sandwich was being made, you cut the sandwich with a knife in half. It's proper to do before eating a sandwich. It made sense. And I just got used to it. So that is where I'm going to drop it. And then we head west. And when we head west back into the living room, in the Model 1 version, I dropped the rope. 
I'm not going to drop the rope because we're doing things a little bit differently here. Instead, we're going to move the rug because the rug is in the way and underneath the rug we will find a trap door. The rug is moved to the side of the room revealing a dusty cover of a closed trap door. Let's open the trap door. The door reluctantly opens to reveal a rickety staircase descending into the darkness. We're going to go down instead of lighting the lamp first. You've moved into a dark place. The trap door crashes shut and you hear someone barring it. It's pitch black, by a grew, yada yada. This sword is glowing with a faint blue glow. I told you about that earlier. And the reason for that is to the north there is a troll. And we're going to go fight the troll in a minute. But first we are going to light our lamp. Because we do not want to be stumbling around and possibly running into something that can kill us. We're in a cellar, a dark and damp cellar with a narrow passageway leading north, a crawlway leading to the south. On the west is the bottom of a steep metal ramp which is unclimbable. Now we are going to head north into the room with the troll. The troll room. This is a small room with passages to the east and south and a forbidding hole leading west. Blood stains and deep scratches, perhaps made by an axe, mar the walls. A nasty-looking troll brandishing a bloody axe blocks all passages out of the room. Your sword has begun to glow very brightly. It is possible for the troll to kill us, so we're going to do this and hope it doesn't kill us. And we do this by saying, kill troll with sword. The fatal blow strikes the troll square in the heart. He dies. Almost as soon as the troll breathes his last breath, a cloud of sinister black fog envelops him, and when the fog lifts, the carcass has disappeared. Your sword is no longer glowing. My sword is not glowing because the danger is gone. Many times in preparing for this, the troll killed my avatar. So we are lucky that this time the troll died on the first hit. Since we no longer need the sword, we're going to drop the sword. There's one other portion where we can use the sword in order to tell us there's danger, and I will explain it when we get there. Instead, what we are going to do now is head to the east. East-West Passage. This is a narrow east-west passageway. There is a narrow stairway leading down at the north end of the room. We're going to go east again. The Round Room. This is a circular stone room with passages in all directions. Several of them have unfortunately been blocked by cave-ins. Let's go southeast. The Engravings Cave. You have entered a low cave with passages leading northwest and east. There are old engravings on the walls here. And we're going to go east. The Dome Room. You are at the periphery of a large dome which forms the ceiling of another room below. Protecting you from a precipitous drop is a wooden railing which circles the dome. We need to go down, and to do that we take the rope that we have and we tie it to the railing. So we're going to tie rope to railing and climb down the rope. That sentence isn't one I recognize. Tie rope railing, there's my mistake. Let's try it again. So the parser is intelligent, but it's not as intuitive as I had hoped. The rope drops over the side and comes within 10 feet of the floor. Torch room. This is a large room with a prominent doorway leading to a down staircase. Above you is a large dome. Up around the edge of the dome, 20 feet up, is a wooden railing. In the center of the room sits a white marble pedestal. A piece of rope descends from the railing above, ending some five feet above your head. Sitting on the pedestal is a flaming torch made of ivory. This torch is one of the treasures, but we're not going to grab it just yet. Instead, we're going to go south to the temple. This is the north end of a large temple. On the east wall is an ancient inscription, probably a prayer, in a language long forgotten. 
Below the prayer is a staircase leading down. The west wall is solid granite. The exit to the north end of the room is through huge marble pillars. There is a brass bell here. The bell is important later as well, so we're not going to get it. Instead, we're going to go east. The Egyptian room. This is a room which looks like an Egyptian tomb. There is an ascending staircase to the west. The solid gold coffin used for the burial of Ramesses II is here. We want to get the coffin. And then we're going to head back the way we came. So we're at the temple with a brass bell. And instead of heading back toward the torch room and back up through the dome room, we are going to go south. Altar. This is the south end of a large temple. In front of you is what appears to be an altar. In one corner is a small hole in the floor which leads into the darkness. You could probably not get back up it. On the two ends of the altar are burning candles. On the altar is a large black book. Open to page 569. We're not going to mess with the candles. We're not going to mess with the book right now. We will come back for them. Instead, we want to use one of the teleportation features of the game and pray. And this will teleport us to the forest. This is a forest with trees in all directions. To the east, there appears to be sunlight. You hear in the distance the chirping of a songbird. First thing first. We are outside. We are no longer in the dark. We are going to extinguish our lamp. The brass lantern is now shut off. Let's go south. Still in the forest. It's a forest that's dimly lit with trees all around. Let's head north. I know we just went south, but now we need to go north. In a small clearing, in a well-marked forest path that extends to the east and west. We're going to go east. Canyon view. We're at the top of Great Canyon on its west wall. From here, there is a marvelous view of the canyon and parts of the frigid river upstream. Across the canyon, the walls of the white cliffs join the mighty ramparts of the Flathead Mountains to the east. Following the canyon upstream to the north, Aragon Falls may be seen, complete with rainbow. The mighty frigid river flows out from a great dark cavern. To the west and south can be seen an immense forest, stretching for miles around. A path leads northwest. It is possible to climb down into the canyon from here. Keep in mind, we're still carrying a coffin, so we're going to go down to the rocky ledge. You are on a ledge about halfway up the wall of the river canyon. You can see from here that the main flow from Aragon Falls twists along a passage which it is impossible for you to enter. Below you is the canyon bottom. Above you is more cliff, which appears climbable. We're going to go down again. We're going for the canyon bottom. Beneath the walls of the river canyon, which may be climbable here, the lesser part of the runoff of Aragon Falls flows by below. To the north is a narrow path. We're going to be going north. End of Rainbow. You're on a small rocky beach on the continuation of a frigid river past the falls. The beach is narrow due to the presence of white cliffs. The river canyon opens here and sunlight shines in from above. A rainbow crosses over the falls to the east and a narrow path continues to the southwest. Here we want to drop the coffin and open the coffin. Dropped. The gold coffin opens. A scepter, possibly that of ancient Egypt itself, is in the coffin. The scepter is ornamented with a colored enamel and tapers to a sharp point. Let's get the scepter and then wave the scepter. Because it's magical, it's going to solidify the rainbow. The rainbow appears to become solid and, I venture, walkable. I think the giveaway was the stairs and banister. A shimmering pot of gold appears at the end of the rainbow. Let's get coffin and the pot. And then we want to head southwest to the canyon bottom, up to the canyon view. There we are. 
Canyon View, northwest into the clearing, and then west. Now we are behind the house, and we want to enter the house. We're back in the kitchen, and while we are here, remember I mentioned the bag earlier? Open the bag. Opening the brown sack reveals a lunch and a clove of garlic. Let's get the garlic, because we will need it later, and I just don't want to have to come back and get it. And then we are going to head west into the living room, and there is a case here, remember? So we are going to open the case and put coffin and scepter in case. See if it'll take it. Opened. It took it, so we put in both the coffin and the scepter in the case, and if you notice, our score is now 85. Next, we want to drop the garlic and put pot in case. So the garlic is dropped, and the pot is in the case. This is important that we're only carrying one item because we are going to open the trap door. We're going after another treasure, which is just around the corner. I was originally planning on doing this later, but instead we're going to do it now and just get it out of the way. So let's go down, and then we light our lamp. And if you notice, the trapdoor did not close this time, which is good, but we're going to illustrate to you how we can use a different exit to get out of here instead of walking back. Remember the last time we went to the north, and that was to go to the troll room? Instead, we're going to go to the south, the east of Chasm. You're at the east edge of a chasm, the bottom of which cannot be seen. A narrow passage goes north, and the path you are on continues to the east. We are going to go to the east. Gallery. This is an art gallery. Most of the paintings have been stolen by vandals with the exceptional taste. The vandals left through either the north or west exits. Fortunately, there is still one chance for you to be a vandal. For on the far wall is a painting of unparalleled beauty. So let's get the painting. And then instead of coming back the direction we came from, we're going to go north to this studio. This appears to have been an artist's studio. The walls and floor are splattered with paints of 69 different colors. Strangely enough, nothing of value is hanging here. At the south end of the room is an open door also covered with paint. A dark and narrow chimney leads up from a fireplace. Although you might be able to get up it, it seems unlikely you could get back down. Loosely attached to a wall is a small piece of paper. Remember in the kitchen, there's a chimney? This chimney connects there, but there's a problem. You cannot go up the chimney if you're carrying too many items. So let's first start by read paper, taken. Congratulations! You are the privileged owner of Zork-1, the Underground Empire, a self-contained and self-maintaining universe. If used and maintained in accordance with normal operating practices for small universes, Zork will provide many months of trouble-free operation. Now, if we look at our inventory, you'll see that we're carrying three items. So let's try to go up the chimney. You can't get up there with what you're carrying. But we drop the paper and go up. We are now in the kitchen. Now let's go west, back into the living room. And we want to put the painting in the case. And then get the garlic. Now, because we've already found a way out, the trapdoor will not close. It will stay open because 
whoever was closing it before has learned that we can get back in the house even though they bar us so it's pointless to try so let's start by going down we're going after a skull right now because why not and in order to do this we need to I never turned the lamp off did I let's go ahead and head north into the troll room this is where the sword is this is where there's a bloody axe and we're going to head east this is the east-west passage and then we're going to go north to a chasm that runs southwest to northeast and a path that follows it you're on the south side of the chasm where a crack opens into a passage let's go northeast Reservoir South. You're in a long room on the south shore of a large lake, far too deep and wide for crossing. There's a path along the stream to the east or west. A steep pathway climbing southwest along the edge is a chasm, and a path leading into the canyon to the southwest. We want to go east here. You are standing on the top of the flood control dam number three, which was quite a tourist attraction in times far distant. There are paths to the north, south, and west, and a scramble down. The sluice gates on the dam are closed. Behind the dam, there can be seen a wide reservoir. Water is pouring over the top of the now abandoned dam. There is a control panel here on which a large metal bolt is mounted. Directly above the bolt is a small green plastic bubble. We want to go north. The dam lobby. This room appears to have been the waiting room for groups of touring the dam. There are open doorways here to the north and east marked private and there is a path leading south over the top of the dam. Some guidebooks entitled Flood Control Dam Number 3 are on the reception desk. There is a matchbook whose cover says Visit Beautiful FCD Number 3 here. Let's get the matches. and read the matchbook. Close cover before striking. You too can make big money in the exciting field of paper shuffling. Mr. Anderson of Muddle, Massachusetts says, Before I took this course, I was a lowly bit twiddler. Now, with what I learned at Goo Tech, I feel really important and can obfuscate and confuse with the best. Dr. Blank has this to say, Ten short days ago, all I could look forward to was a dead-end job as a doctor. Now I have a promising future and make really big Zork meds. GUE Tech can't promise these fantastic results to everyone, but when you earn your degree from GUE Tech, your future will be brighter. There's also a book here, remember? So let's read the book. First we take it. Flood Control Dam Number 3, FCD Number 3, was constructed in the year 783 of the Great Underground Empire to harness the mighty Frigid River. This work was supported by a grant of 37 million Zork Mids from your omnipotent local tyrant lord, Dimwit Flathead the Excessive. This impressive structure is composed of 370,000 cubic feet of concrete. It is 256 feet tall at the center and 193 feet wide at the top. The lake created behind the dam has a volume of 1.7 billion cubic feet and an area of 12 million square feet and a shoreline of 36,000 feet. We will now point out some of the more interesting features of FCD3s as we conduct you on a guided tour of the facilities. One. You start your tour here in the dam lobby. You will notice on your right that... Let's drop the book, because we do not need it anymore, and we're going to go north. The maintenance room. This is what appears to have been a maintenance room for a flood control dam number three. Apparently, this room has been ransacked recently, for most of the valuable equipment is gone. On the wall in front of you is a group of buttons colored blue, yellow, brown, and red. There are doorways to the west and south. There is a group of tool chests here. There is a wrench here. There is an object which looks like a tube of toothpaste here. There is a screwdriver here. We want the screwdriver. 
and the wrench. And then we want to push a button. The button we want to push is the yellow button. And then we need to head south again to the dam lobby and then south again, but this time we are at the dam. You're standing on top of Flood Control Dam number three, which is quite the tourist attraction in times distant. As you can see, we've already read this. Remember, there's the bolt and the green plastic bubble, which is now glowing. It was not glowing before. This tells us that's when we push the button what it did. So we want to turn the bolt with the wrench. The sluice gates open and water pours through the dam. We do not need the wrench anymore, so let's drop it. And then we are going to go south. Deep Canyon. You're at the south edge of a deep canyon. Passages lead off to the east, northwest, and southwest. A stairway leads down. You can hear a loud roaring sound like that of rushing water from below. We need to go down. Loud Room. This is a large room with a ceiling which cannot be detected from the ground. There is a narrow passage from the east to the west and a stone stairway leading upward. The room is deafeningly loud with an undetermined rushing sound. The sound seems to reverberate from all the walls, making it difficult to think. On the ground is a large platinum bar. It is unbearably loud here with an ear-splitting roar seeming to come from all around you. There is a pounding in your head which won't stop. With a tremendous effort, you scramble out of the room back to the round room. We are lucky because that is where we wanted to scramble out of. Sometimes you have to go and try doing it multiple times. By the way, we will eventually solve that room and we will get the platinum bar, just not right now. Instead, we are going to go to the southeast into the engravings cave. We have been here before. We're going to go east and this is the dome room where we have the rope going over the railing and so we're going to Climb down the rope. And this puts us into the torch room. Remember I said we were going to get this torch later? We are getting it now, so let's get torch and extinguish. The lamp. Since the torch is burning, we do not need the lantern for our light. Now we're going to go south. This is where the bell was, and we're going to get the bell. Now we need to go south. Remember the altar? I told you we were not doing anything with the candles or the book then. We're going to read the book now. So first thing is we automatically take the book. Commandment number one, two, five, nine, or two. O ye who go about saying unto each, Hello, sailor, dost thou know the magnitude of thy sin before the gods? Yea, verily thou shalt be ground between two stones. Shall the angry gods cast thy body into the whirlpool? Surely thy eyes shall be put out with a sharp stick, even unto the ends of the earth thou shalt wander, and unto the land of the dead shalt thou be sent at last. Surely thou shalt repent of thy cunning. Now we have read the book. We're not going to drop the book. We are, however, going to get the candles. See, the book will be useful later. And we do not want the candles to go out. They will end up going out on their own, because we're going to go down into a cave. This is a tiny cave with entrances west and north and a dark forbidding staircase leading down. We're going to go down again. Entrance to Hades. You are outside a large gateway on which is inscribed, Abandon hope all ye who enter here. The gate is open. Through it you can see desolation with a pile of mangled bodies in one corner, thousands of voices lamenting some hideous fate can be heard through the gate is barred, 
by evil spirits who jeer at your attempts to pass. Now what we are going to do here is going to require an exacting order of things. So the first thing we want to do is ring the bell. This will get the attention of the evil spirits. The bell suddenly becomes red hot and falls to the ground. The wraiths, as if paralyzed, stop their jeering and slowly turn to face you. On their ashen faces, the expression of long-forgotten terror takes shape. In your confusion, the candles drop to the ground, and they go out. Let's get the candles. We need the candles. And then we want to light a match. One of the matches starts to burn. Let's light the candles with a match. The candles are lit. The flames flicker wildly and appear to dance. The earth beneath your feet trembles and your legs nearly buckle beneath you. The spirits cower at your unearthly power. The match has gone out. That's okay because the candles are lit. And now we want to read the book again. The book is going to say the same thing. Each word of the prayer reverberates through the hall in a deafening confusion. As the last word fades, a voice loud and commanding speaks, Be gone, fiends! A heart-stopping scream fills the cavern, and the spirits sensing greater power flee through the walls. That is the end of the exact sequence. So, we do not need the book anymore. We're going to drop it, and then we're going to go south. We are now in the land of the dead. You have entered the land of the living dead. Thousands of lost souls can be heard weeping and moaning. In the corner are stacked the remains of dozens of previous adventurers less fortunate than yourself. A passage exits to the north. Lying in one corner of the room is a beautifully carved crystal skull. It appears to be grinning at you rather nastily. So let's get the skull. And we're going to head back north. We're getting out of here. See, remember the bell? It's laying on the ground and it's red hot. So now let's go up into the cave and a gust of wind blows out the candles. That is okay because we still have the torch. So we're going to go north again. This is the mirror room, and if the candles had not been out by now, I would have blown out the candles. But I'm going to keep carrying the candles just in case something happens. There's a thief that roams around, and sometimes he runs into you and he steals something, and if he steals my light source, I want to have a light source. So if I have multiple light sources, he can't steal them all. They're in a large square room with tall ceilings. On the south wall is an enormous mirror which fills the entire wall. There are exits on the other three sides of the room. Now, this is a mirror room, and there are actually two different mirror rooms. This is the mirror room, often thought of as mirror room south. It's the south one. I want to call it the south mirror room. There is a mirror room on the north end of the map as well. And we can call that Mirror Room North or the North Mirror Room. And we are going to rub the mirror because when we do this, it's going to teleport us from this room to the other room. And it bypasses the reservoir and it saves us 10 moves that we can use. So let's go ahead and rub the mirror. And see, we are still in what says a mirror room. It's just a different mirror room. There's a rumble from deep within the earth, and the room shakes. Now let's go find something else. And to do that, we go north. This is a cold and damp corridor where a long east-west passageway turns into a southward path. We are going to go west. This is a slide room. This is a small chamber which appears to have been part of a coal mine. On the south wall of the chamber, the letters Granite Wall are etched in the rock. To the east is a long passage, and there is a steep metal slide with 
twisting downward to the north. It's a small opening. There is a sword here. This slide returns to the cellar, which is we've been to many times, so I do not need to explain it. Instead, we're going to go north. This is the mine entrance. You are standing at the entrance of what might have been a coal mine. The shaft enters the west wall, and there is another exit on the south end of the room. We are going to go west. Squeaky room. You're in a small room. Strange squeaky sounds may be heard coming from the passage at the north end. You may also escape to the east. We are now going to go north again. The bathroom. You're in a small room which has doors only to the east and south. We came from the south, so when we leave we'll be going east. In the corner of the room, on the ceiling, is a large vampire bat who's obviously deranged and holding his nose. There's an exquisite jade figurine here. He's holding his nose because we are carrying the garlic. If we were not carrying the garlic, we would be in trouble. Shaft room. This is a large room. In the middle of the room is a small shaft descending through the floor into the darkness below. To the west and the north are exits from this room. Constructed over the top of the shaft is a metal framework to which a heavy iron chain is attached. At the end of the chain is a basket. We want to put our torch in the basket. The reason we are doing this is where we are going from here, if we take an open flame with us, we're going into an area where there's freestanding gas and it will explode and kill us. So now we're going to need our lamp in order to see. Uh-oh, I do not know the word lie. So now let's go north. The smelly room. This is a small nondescript room. However, from the direction of a small descending staircase, a foul odor can be detected. To the south is a narrow tunnel. We're going to go down. A gas room. This is a small room which smells strongly of coal gas. There's a short climb up some stairs and a narrow tunnel leading east. There's a sapphire encrusted bracelet here. We want the bracelet, just not yet. Instead, we're going to do a little bit of back and forth for a moment. So we're going to go east. This is a nondescript part of a coal mine. What this is, is a maze. We're going to go northeast, and then southeast, and then southwest. Then we want to go down. Ladder top. This is a very small room. In the corner is a rickety wooden ladder leading downward. It might be safe to descend. There is also a staircase leading upward. Let's go down again. Ladder bottom. This is a rather wide room. On one side is the bottom of a narrow wooden ladder. To the west and the south are passages leaving the room. So now we need to go south. Dead end. You've come to a dead end in the mine. There is a small pile of coal here. We want to get the coal. Coal is now taken. Now let's head back the direction from which we came. And then we want to go up. And then we want to go up again. And then north. Followed by east. Followed by south. Followed by north followed by up, followed by south. Shaft room. At the end of the chain is a basket. The basket contains a torch providing light. We want to put the coal and screwdriver in basket. and then lower the basket. And now we want to head back down into the smelly room and go from there. And to do that, we need to go north into the smelly room and then back down into the gas room. Still going to leave the bracelet here. Instead, we are going to go east. 
and then northeast, and then southeast, and then southwest, and then down, and down again. And instead of going south from here, we're going to go west. Timber room. This is a long and narrow passage which is cluttered with broken timbers. A wide passage comes from the east and turns at the very end of the room into a very narrow passageway. From the west comes a strong draft. There is a broken timber here. We want to drop everything we are carrying. That includes our lantern. And we are going to go west. We're leaving the lantern on because we're going to need it. When we go west, we're going to go into a room where we have lowered our torch so we will have light. Drafty room. This is a small drafty room in which is the bottom of a long shaft. To the south is a passageway and to the east is a very narrow passage. In the shaft can be seen a heavy iron chain. At the end of the chain is a basket. The basket contains a screwdriver, a small pile of coal, a torch providing light. So we want the get the torch, the coal, and the screwdriver. And then we want to go south. Machine room. This is a large, cold room whose sole exit is to the north. In one corner there is a machine which is reminiscent of a clothes dryer. On its face is a switch which is labeled start. The switch does not appear to be manipulable by any human hand unless the fingers are about 1 16th by 1 quarter inch. On the front of the machine is a large lid which is closed. So let's open the lid. And if we did not have the screwdriver, we could not do this. And put coal in the machine. The lid opens. Done. Now we want to close the lid. And then we will turn the switch with the screwdriver. The machine comes to life, figuratively, with a dazzling display of colored lights and a bizarre noises. After a few moments, the excitement abates. Let's open the lid. The lid opens, revealing a huge diamond. I need to get me one of those. And we do not need it anymore, so let's drop the screwdriver and get the diamond. Let's head north now. And let's put the torch and diamond into the basket. And then we are going to go east. There's some things there we, that we dropped here. What we want is we want to get the skull and lamp and garlic. look to make sure we're not leaving anything important. So we do not need the matchbook, we do not need the candles, and we're going to leave the broken timber here. We're just going to bring the skull, the lamp, and the garlic. Now we're going to head east, which will take us back to the ladder room, and then we're going to go up. Up again. And then we want to go north, east, south, and north. This is the gas room. There is a sapphire encrusted bracelet here. We want to finally get the bracelet. And then we're going to go up 
to the smelly room and south to the shaft room where the basket is hung from the chain. It, and to do that, we need to raise the basket. The basket is raised to the top of the shaft. We want to get our torch and diamond and extinguish our lamp. We can extinguish the lamp because we are using the torch again. From here we go west. This is the bat room. We still have the garlic, so the vampire bat is still holding his nose and he's not going to come near us. Let's get the figurine. And then we are going to head back to our trophy case, but we're going to take a shortcut and instead of going through everything to get there, we're just going to go to where the slide is and take the slide. To do that, we go south to the squeaky room, east to the mine entrance, and south again, which puts us in the slide room. There's a sword here. We are going to go down, which now we are in the cellar. From here, we go up into the living room where we have a collection of treasures, and we're going to put the diamond, put the diamond and figurine and bracelet and so the diamond, the figurine, the bracelet, and the skull in the case. We still will have to put the torch in afterward, but I was running out of characters. So put the torch in the case. And then we will drop the garlic. So let's go get ourselves some more treasures. And to do that, we need to go down. And then we will light our lamp. And then we are going to go north to the troll room and east to the east-west passage, and then north again to the chasm, and northeast to Reservoir South. You are in a long room to the north, which was formerly a lake. However, with water level lowered, there is merely a wide stream running through the center of the room. There is a path along the stream to the east or west, a steep pathway climbing southwest along the edge of a chasm, and a path leading into a canyon to the southeast. We are going to head north. Reservoir. You're on what used to be a large lake, but which is now a large mud pile. There are shores to the north and south. Lying half buried in the mud is an old trunk bulging with jewels. Let's get the trunk. It's obviously a treasure. It has jewels. And then we're going to head north. Reservoir North, you are in a large cavernous room, to the south of which was formerly a lake. However, with the water level lowered, there is merely a wide stream running through here. There is a slimy stairway leaving the room to the north. There is a handheld air pump here. Let's get the pump. And then we're going to head north. The Atlantis Room. This is an ancient room, long underwater. There is an exit to the south and a staircase leading up. On the shores lies Poseidon's own crystal trident. Not sure why we're getting Poseidon's trident, but I am not going to complain. Unfortunately, it's not going to allow me to control the waves or control the ocean or bring about a tidal wave or anything like that, but it's still a treasure, so Let's go south. So we are heading back to Reservoir South. Here we are. And then we're going to go east to the dam. This is where we drop the wrench. And we're going to go east again. 
the dam base. You're at the base of flood control dam number three, which looms above you and to the north. The river Frigid is flowing by here. Along the river are the white cliffs which seem to form giant walls stretching from north to south along its shores of the river as it winds its way downstream. There is a folded pile of plastic here which has a small valve attached. Inflate the bow with the pump. The boat inflates and appears seaworthy. A tan label is lying inside the boat. Read the label. Taken. Vrulba's Magic Boat Company. Hello, sailor. Instructions for use. To get into a body of water, say launch. To get to shore, say land, or the direction which you want to maneuver the boat. Warranty. This boat is guaranteed against all defects for a period of 76 milliseconds from date of purchase or until first used, whichever comes first. Warning, this boat is made of thin plastic. Good luck. That warning is important because there are items you could pick up and carry which are sharp, which will puncture the boat, and you could use the tube of gunk in order to fix punctures in the boat, or you can die out there. There is another thing you could do, though. You could have carried the sack with you that was in the kitchen and put things in the sack and therefore prevent the sharp edges from puncturing the boat. We don't do any of those. We just don't bring anything along. It's safer that way. Now let's drop the label because it is an item that takes up inventory space. And then we want to get in the boat. You are now in the magic boat. Let's launch the boat. Frigid River. In the magic boat, you are on the Frigid River in the vicinity of the dam. The river flows quietly here. There is a landing on the west shore. Now, you might be tempted to do things here, but really the best thing you can do is wait. You just let the river carry you. So, time passes, the flow of the river carries you downstream, frigid river. In the magic boat, the river turns a corner here, making it impossible to see the dam. The white cliffs loom on the east bank and large rocks prevent landing on the west. We're going to wait. And we shall continue to wait. The flow of the river carries you downstream. Frigid River. In the magic boat, the river descends here into a valley. There is a narrow beach on the west shore below the cliffs. In the distance, a faint rumbling can be heard. We shall continue to wait. The flow of the river carries you downstream. Frigid River. In the magic boat, the river is running faster here, and the sound ahead appears to be that of rushing water. On the east shore is a sandy beach. A small area of beach can also be seen below the cliffs on the west shore. There is a red buoy here, probably a warning. We want to get the buoy. Taken. And we want to go east. This takes us onto the sandy beach. In the magic boat, you are on a large sandy beach on the east shore of the river, which is flowing quickly by. A path runs beside the river to the south here, and a passage is partially buried in the sand to the northeast. There is a shovel here, outside of the magic boat. Let's get out of the boat. You are on your own feet again. Now let's open the buoy. There is a large emerald. Let's get the emerald and drop the buoy. Get the shovel and then we want to go northeast. 
Sandy Cave. This is a sand-filled cave whose exit is to the southwest. Now, I suggest saving here if you are playing this yourself, because what we're going to do can cause us to get buried and cause an end of game. So we're going to start digging. So we're going to dig in the sand with the shovel. You seem to be digging a hole here. We're going to keep digging. The hole is getting deeper. You're surrounded by a wall of sand on all sides. You can see a scarab here in the sand. So we want to drop the shovel and get the scarab. And then we want to get out of here. And we do that by going southwest. So we're back on the sandy beach. This is where we came out from the water. You can tell because there's the buoy and the magic boat here. We're going to go south. Shore. You're on an east shore of the river. The water here seems somewhat treacherous. A path travels from north to south here. The south end quickly turns around a sharp corner. We're going to go south again. Aragain Falls. You are at the top of Aragain Falls, an enormous waterfall with a drop of about 450 feet. The only path here is on the north end. A solid rainbow spans the falls. We're going to cross the rainbow. End of rainbow. This is where we got the pot of gold earlier. Let's extinguish the lamp. And now we want to go southwest. So we're back at the canyon bottom, and this is where we carried the coffin back up the cliffside. And now that we're at the canyon view, we want to go northwest, which will lead us to the clearing, and then we go west to behind the house, and then we enter the house. So we're in the kitchen. We all remember the kitchen. And then we go west into the living room. And as you see, we have a list of treasures that is slowly growing. And here, we want to put the scarab, and emerald, and chest, and trident in the case. You see it? Put all of those in there, and if we check our inventory, we are just carrying the air pump and the lantern. We don't really need the air pump anymore, so let's just go ahead and drop the air pump. Now let's go east through the kitchen and east back out of the window so we are behind the house and then we're going to go north to north of the house you are facing the north side of a white house there is no door here and all the windows are boarded up to the north narrow path winds through the trees we're going to go north again Forest path. This is a forest path winding through a dimly lit forest. The path heads north-south here. One particularly large tree with some low branches stands at the edge of the path. That just screams climb tree. You're at about 10 feet above the ground, nestled among some large branches. The nearest branch above you is above your reach. Beside you on a branch is a small bird's nest, and the bird's nest is a large egg encrusted with precious jewels, apparently scavenged by a childless songbird. The egg is covered with fine gold inlay and ornamented in lapis lazuli and mother of pearl. Unlike most eggs, this one is hinged and closed with a delicate-looking clasp. 
the egg appears extremely fragile. Of course we're going to get the egg. And then we are going to climb down. And then let's head back to the house. South. East. Enter the house. West. And instead of dropping the egg in the trophy case, instead we are going to go down, light our lamp, and go north into the troll's room. Now we are going to head our way through a maze again. And to do that, we go west into the maze, and then we go south, and then we go east, and then up. And you see here, there is a skeleton, probably the remains of a luckless adventurer. And beside the skeleton is a rusty knife. The deceased adventurer's useless lantern is here, and there's a skeleton key here. An old leather bag bulging with coins is also here. Do not mess with anything other than the bag of coins and the key. If you mess with the knife and attempt to use the knife, it will kill you. It will turn on you and cause you to cut your throat. Do not do that. One thing that is important, and I mentioned I would bring this up later, is if you are carrying the sword, the elvish sword, it will be glowing a light blue here, and that is a warning to you about the knife. So let's get the bag and the key. Nothing else, remember that. And then we are going to go southwest, east, south, and southeast, and this puts us in the Cyclops room. This room has an exit on the northwest and a staircase leading up. A Cyclops, who looks prepared to eat horses, much less mere adventurers, blocks the staircase. From his state of health and the blood stains on the walls, you gather that he is not very friendly, though he likes people, as in he likes to eat people. One of the solutions is you could give the Cyclops the sandwich and the bottle of water. He will eat and fall to sleep. But then you have to go back through the maze every time you want to do anything around this area. Instead, what you can do is you can say the word Ulysses. The Cyclops, hearing the name of his father's deadly nemesis, flees the room by knocking down the wall on the east of the room. This knocking down the wall, you will see in a moment where it leads, but first we're going to go up into the thief's room. You hear a scream of anguish as you violate the robber's hideaway. Using passages unknown to you, he rushes to its defense. The thief gestures mysteriously and the treasures in the room suddenly vanish. Treasure room. This is a large room whose east wall is solid granite. A number of discarded bags, which crumble at your touch, are scattered about on the floor. There is an exit down a staircase. There is a suspicious looking individual holding a large bag. Leaning against one wall, he is armed with a deadly stiletto. There is a silver chalice intricately engraved here. The thief stabs nonchalantly with the stiletto and misses. You could attempt to fight the thief, but do not. You need the thief alive right now, and the best thing you can do is distract him. So we are going to give the egg to the thief. The thief is taken aback by your unexpected generosity, but accepts the jewel-encrusted egg and stops to admire its beauty. So let's get out of here. We're going to go down, then we're back in the Cyclops room, and we're going to go east. This is a strange passage. It's a long passage. To the west is one entrance. On the east, there is an old wooden door. 
with a large opening in it about the size of a cyclops. A seedy-looking individual with a large bag just wandered through the room. On the way through, he quietly abstracted some valuables from the room and from your possession. Mumbling something about doing unto others before. Remember I mentioned that there's a thief who steals things from you? We just dealt with a thief, and he just passed by, and he stole something. I don't care what he stole, because I'm going to get it back. Instead, I'm going to go to the east again. Now let's check my inventory. See, I'm no longer carrying the bag of coins. That's what he took. So let's go east. And remember the nasty knife? Let's get the knife. And then we are going to go west to the living room. And then we are going to go west again to the strange passage and west to the cyclops room. Now you notice how we didn't have to go through the maze in order to get here again. That's a great thing. and. Some people, I am told, after a discussion in a Zork community, prefer to start with the Cyclops so that they can clear this area out. But I prefer to save it to the end because if you save the thief to the end, it's much easier to kill him than if you try to do it early on. The more of your score, the better your chances of killing the thief are. So let's go ahead and head up and to kill the thief who, by the way, we wanted to give him a chance to play with the treasure, the egg, because as he plays with it, he opens it for us. We're incapable of opening it. Now, notice the thief immediately attacked us coming into the room. So we want to kill the thief with the knife. A savage blow on the thigh. The thief is stunned, but he can still fight. A long theatrical slash, you catch it on your nasty knife, but the thief twists his knife and the knife goes flying. So, we need to get our knife back. And then we dodge the thief. Now let's kill the thief with the knife. The force of your blow knocks the thief back. Stunned, the thief slowly regains his feet. Again. A quick stroke, but the thief is on guard. A parry, you parry a lightning thrust, and the thief salutes you with a grim nod. Your nasty knife crashes down, knocking the thief into dreamland. The thief is unconscious, but I want him dead. The unarmed thief cannot defend himself. He dies. Almost as soon as the thief breathes his last breath, a cloud of sinister black fog envelops him, and when the fog lifts, the carcass has disappeared. As the thief dies, the power of his magic decreases, and his treasures reappear. A leather bag of coins, a stiletto, a jewel-encrusted egg with a clockwork canary. The chalice is now safe to take. So let's get everything. Leather bag of coins, the stiletto, the egg, and the chalice. And now we're going to go for a little bit of a walk. To do that, we need to head down. So we're back in the Cyclops room. And then we're going to go northwest. Oh, look, we're back in the maze. But we're going to go south. And then we are going to go west. And then we are going to go up. And then we will go down. Notice our lamp appears a little bit dimmer. And then we will go northeast. That's because the battery is starting to run low. You're in a small room near the maze. There are twisty passages in the immediate vicinity. Above you is a grating locked with a skull and crossbones lock. So let's unlock the grate. With the skeleton key, the grate is unlocked. 
Let's open the grate. The grating opens to reveal trees above you. A pile of leaves falls onto your head and to the ground. Let's count the leaves. There are 69,105 leaves here. That is a lot of leaves. So now we go up to get out of here. We're in the clearing. With a forest surrounding you on all sides, a path leads south. There is an open grating descending into the darkness. Let's extinguish our lamp. The brass lantern is now off. So let's head back to the tree that we were in earlier. And to do that, we go south. So this is where we hear the distant chirping of a songbird. Let's climb. It's important to have a map so you can remember where everything is. So we climb a tree, up a tree, and there's the small bird's nest. We are going to wind up canary because there's a canary in the egg. We want to keep the canary in the egg so that we're only carrying one item. The canary chirps slightly off key, an aria from a forgotten opera. From out of the greenery flies a lovely songbird. It perches on a limb just over your head and opens its beak to sing. As it does so, a beautiful brass bauble drops from its mouth and bounces off the top of your head and lands glimmering in the grass. As the canary winds down, the songbird flies away. You hear in the distance the chirping of a songbird. So let's climb down. And then get the bauble. Now we want to return some of these treasures back to the house. So we shall go south and then east. And then we are going to enter the house. Let's see how if we do window. We are in the kitchen and we are going to go west. Now we want to put the bauble and stiletto in the case. I do not have the bauble, so we are going to go back for the bauble. In a moment, let's put the stiletto in the case. And put coins in the case. And now let's go ahead and head back out to get the bobble. And we do that by going east, east, north, north, get the bobble, and then we go south, east, enter the house, we go west, Put the bobble in the case. Check our inventory. So we want to put the chalice in the case. Open the egg. Remove the canary from the egg. Put egg and canary in the case.
and then we want to go down. We need to go get the platinum bar. Do you remember that? Light the lamp. Then we go north. And then we want to go east. East again. East again. So remember, this is the loud room where it makes it difficult to think. But instead of it kicking us out of the room immediately this time, we are allowed a chance to make a move, and the solution is to say the word echo. The acoustics of the room change subtly. Loud room, on the ground is a large platinum bar. Let's get the bar, and then we want to head back to the troll room. And from the troll room, we want to go south into the cellar, and then we go back up into the living room. And I am going to just tell it, put all except lamp in case. Just put everything I have in the case. An almost inaudible voice whispers in your ear, look to your treasures for the final secret. What it means by look to your treasures is to look in the case. It's one sentence I don't recognize. We'll look, and if you see you are in a living room, there is a doorway to the east, to the west is a cyclops shape opening in an old wooden door, above which is some strange gothic lettering, a trophy case, and a rug lying beside an open trap door. There's a handheld air pump here. There's a clove of garlic here. In the trophy case is an ancient parchment which appears to be a map that was not there before. Your collection of treasures consists of a skeleton key, a nasty knife, a platinum bar, a golden clockwork canary, a jewel encrusted egg, a chalice, a beautiful brass bauble, a leather bag of coins, a stiletto, a crystal trident, a trunk of jewels, a large emerald, a beautiful and jewel scarab, a torch providing light, a crystal skull, a sapphire encrusted bracelet, a jade figurine, a huge diamond, a painting, a pot of gold, a scepter, a gold coffin. That is all of our treasures. And we know it's all of our treasures because it gave us the map. So we take the map and let's head back to the mailbox. And we do that by going east through the kitchen, east back outside. And we're going to go south south of the house, and we're going to go west. And this is where we started, west of the house where there's a small mailbox. And here we want to read the map. The map shows a forest with three clearings. The largest clearing contains a house. Three paths leave the large clearing. One of these paths leading southwest is marked to the barrow. So we want to go southwest to the barrow. The stone barrow you are standing in front of a massive barrow of stone. In the east face is a huge stone door which is open. You cannot see into the dark of the tomb. And we go west again. Inside the barrow. As you enter the barrow, the door closes inexorably behind you. Around it is dark, but ahead of you is an enormous cavern brightly lit. Through its center runs a wide stream. Spanning the stream is a small wooden footbridge, and beyond a path leads into a dark tunnel. Above the bridge, floating in the air, is a large sign. It reads, All ye who stand before this bridge have completed a great and perilous adventure, which has tested your wit and courage. You have mastered the first part of the Zork trilogy. Those who pass over this bridge must be prepared to undertake an even greater adventure that will severely test your skill and bravery. The Zork trilogy continues with Zork II, the Wizard of Froboz, and is completed in Zork III, the Dungeon Master. Your score is 350, total of 350 points in 366 moves. This gives you the rank of Master Adventurer. End of session. So, despite some typos, I feel that went pretty well, and I decided to leave those typos in because, after all, I am human and I make mistakes. As a good example, you'll remember I missed the part about the bobble not being picked up, 
and if I had been more aggressive about dropping the air pump, that would not have happened. But hey, you got to see the system in action. Now you might be asking yourself, is Noriko sick of Zork yet? I've played it so many times throughout the past few months, it would make sense if I was, but I'm not. And that's a good thing too, because I still have to bring you through Zork 2 and Zork 3, which you should be looking forward to soon. I do not have a lot of critique of this game. It's kind of hard to have a critique when something is literally the standard by which all of its genre is judged. It is the critique, and I feel that it's a well-earned place in history. I'm instead going to say, you should play this yourself. There are ways you can run this on modern systems, and if you need help with that, I can be that help. While you consider that, let me remind you, it only takes an instant of your time to like and or subscribe to my channel. Literally, a gentle mouse movement and click. Maybe two. It is not a lot to ask of you from me. And if you have questions or comments or requests, I'm here. Just message me. Let me know what you think or feel or want to see. Help me help you. And remember, be good to each other. Be kind to yourself. And I look forward to our next adventure together.